All right. Good morning and welcome to the May Plants, Pests and Pathogens. We have a wonderful lineup today. We're so excited to learn more about grasses and sedges. Shannon Curry from Hoffman Nursery is here with us. Then we have uh, Mike and Matt with the Plant Disease and Insect Clinic telling us about the be on the lookout for pest and disease issues coming up. Um, I'll finish us out with a Plant These Instead segment, segment where we'll be looking at invasive vines to avoid planting and what you can plant instead, and a few announcements at the very end. So we're so happy to welcome Shannon with us today. Shannon Curry is the Marketing Director for Hoffman Nursery, which is a wholesale nursery um, located in North Carolina specializing in ornamental and native grasses. Um, Shannon's been at Hoffman since 2007. She's had several different roles. She's coordinated the plant evaluation program. Uh, she manage, has, been, has managed the sales team and um, oversees the marketing program. She writes articles for national trade publications. And if you search her name, you can find lots of great articles on grasses and sedges. And um, she speaks at public gardens and at different organizations. She currently serves as the Southern Region Director for the Perennial Plant Association. And she represents North Carolina's nursery and landscape industry on the North Carolina Plant Conservation Program Scientific Committee, which I believe is with the Department of Agriculture. So that committee, yeah. So we are so happy to have you here, Shannon, and we are so excited to learn about grasses and sedges. They are the new workhorses of the garden. So I'm going to turn it over to you. I'm going to stop sharing so you can get your screen share up okay, and tell great. us all about some of the wonderful grasses and sedges we can be using in our gardens. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Charlotte. I appreciate it. And I, I very much appreciate y'all asking me to be here. Um, I love talking about grasses and sedges. And today we're going to sort of narrow the focus a little bit because of the just time constraints. Um, but really what I'm going to start with is, is helping us understand grasses, how we can use them. And um, let me just make sure any, everybody can see the screen okay. The sharing yes, all right. looks good. Yes. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. All right, so let's get started. And just a quick overview of Hoffman Nursery. And uh, so we are a wholesale nursery, as Charlotte said. We are um, located in Rougemont, so just north of Durham. And we are wholesale. We are what's referred to as a liner nursery. Um, and that you can see really here in this is the plant that we typically grow. So that's what we call a liner or a plug. It's a smaller size plant that we typically sell to other wholesale nurseries that grow them out to a larger size that you might find in a garden center. We also sell quite a bit to landscape contractors who put that liner directly into the ground. Um, we ship grasses, sedges, and rushes all over North America. We have customers in out west, um, in Canada as well. And as I noted, we only grow grasses, sedges, and grass-like plants. Um, that's it. Um, and we are grass specialists. So um, we've do, been in business since, um, oh, hold on, excuse me, y'all. I've got my windows in the wrong spot. Okay, we've been in business since uh, 1986. Um, the Hoffman started the nursery, so it's family owned. Um, and it has been clear to us um, that as grass specialists, that grasses really have increased in popularity um, quite a bit. And I think part of that is due to really prominent projects like the High Line in New York City, uh, the Lurie Garden in Chicago's Millennium Park. And I think there are also some trends going on um, in that uh, if we look at the rise of, in popularity of native plants, also, there is a movement uh, in, that's a very progressive movement in planting design, which Pete Aldoff, who designed these two landscapes I just mentioned, um, has, has really uh, been on the forefront of, especially in the US. And in addition, um, we understand that people want more from their landscapes. And we really see this, especially in public landscapes. So um, in Raleigh, at the Sassafras All Children's Playground, in our public spaces, we're seeing the use of grasses more and more. Um, if you look at Durham, the Golden Belt um, complex, it's a redevelopment of an uh, old um, uh, te textile mill in Durham, um, in Chattanooga, Tennessee, in this redevelopment project, in, the, in Asheville, um, even very simple plantings 
really are employing grasses and gra grasses more and more. Um, it really is prime time for grasses and sedges. And if we ask ourselves why, I really think it comes down to those three sort of general uh, trends that you, if you will, the popularity of native plants, progressive planting design, and people wanting more from their landscapes. What we want from grasses, excuse me, from plants has really changed. I think um, I'm really preaching to the choir here when I say that we understand that plants aren't just pretty. There are economic, environmental, and health benefits, a whole host of them um, that plants provide to us. Um, Charlie Hall, Dr. Charlie Hall is at Texas A&M University, and he and his colleagues have done a number of literature reviews and have a wonderful website about the benefits of plants. So we know, for example, that um, they reduce and clean stormwater runoff. We know that they can reduce energy consumption. So creating green roofs can reduce the amount of um, energy required to heat and cool a building. It can also help manage and clean the stormwater runoff that, that lands on our uh, public spaces, our residential areas, on the top of buildings. We can support and sustain wildlife in ways um, that really can start, we hope, to address the habitat loss that development has, has created. We also know that plants help reduce stress and improve our health, um, which is obviously very important in the face of the pandemic. We also know that being around plants can improve memory and concentration. Uh, for example, if you are looking at a landscape right now out your window, as I am, or you have plants in your room uh, with you, you may re remember 20% more information than if you didn't have access to those plants. Um, so there are a whole host of sort of those health benefits and, and psychological benefits. Uh, we could reduce heat island effects. So we know our landscapes can do more. And um, given that, excuse me, I'm having window problems here. Um, and I think that need for our landscapes doing more really shows in the trends that we see in residential landscape architecture. So for example, this is a survey done by the American Society of Landscape Architects of their residential clients. And I think the most recent one was 2018. And you really can see the trends here. If we're looking for native plants, the things I've mentioned, drought tolerant landscapes, low maintenance landscapes, native plants, um, rain gardens that and all of those trends that I've highlighted there in dark green, the grasses and sedges that our nursery grows really are relevant for all the points in darker green. And those trends I mentioned before, native plants, planting design and more sustainable landscapes. But I'll note, you know, what's going on with that reduced lawn area? Because as we know, we love our lawns. Americans love lawns. We love that vast expanse of emerald green that's free of weeds and pristine and we can mow these cool patterns in it. We love lawns because it makes us feel good about what we're doing on our landscapes. But there are significant downsides to those that we are seeing increasingly and are becoming increasingly important. Um, if we think about the amount of of fossil fuels that go into uh, lawn mowing our lawns. So we know that um, hour for hour gasoline power lawnmowers produce 11 times as much pollution as a new car. We know that pesticides go in into maintaining that weed free and insect free lawn. We also know that yard waste, 20% of municipal solid waste collection, 20% of what our municipalities have to pay for and deal with comes from yard waste. And a lot of those are grass clippings. In addition, we, when we think about water, we know that a turf grass landscape absorbs far less water runoff from a stormwater event than does a natural woodland landscape. We know that most of the residential water use really goes toward irrigating our lawns. And according to some studies, uh, the surface area in the US that's devoted to lawns is up to three times greater than the amount of land use spent on irrigated corn, for example. Our biggest irrigated crop in the US is lawns. So the resources we pour into keeping our lawns green and free of other plants and weeds is tremendous. And 
so we are spending a lot of resources and I think it's troubling in the face of what we know about climate change. So for example, if you look at North Carolina's recent um, action plan for looking at climate risk and resilience, and some of the broad findings you see here, what's going to be happening is that we're gonna see more extreme rain events punctuated by longer periods of drought in between those. What that means is greater runoff from stormwater events. And we know flooding is increasing. We know erosion is increasing. So those heavy rain events, especially after periods of drought, cause significant erosion. That puts sediment into our waterways, that puts pollutants into our waterways. That has to be treated. It also goes out into the ocean. Um, we're also going to have super dry conditions, as we all know. Um, this recent yesterday, the storms that came through hit Raleigh, but not Durham. Um, so we're seeing really lots of, of differences in those conditions. So I think we have to ask ourselves and our, our, con, our constituents, our clients are also asking, how can we continue with these large areas that require lots of resources to keep them looking pristine? The answer really is we have to look at alternatives. And one of those alternatives to large areas of irrigated and man highly managed lawns is to just reduce the size of our traditional lawn. We want to use plants that provide a similar look or function, but use fewer resources. And we want to gain more ecosystem services. So if you look at this typical landscape, so this is right outside. This is in the neighborhood where I live. This is a major thoroughfare that you see on the left-hand side. This is the back of someone's residential landscape. Um, so it, the back faces a street. Um, so to maintain this landscape as it is, it has to be mulched periodically, usually once, sometimes twice a year. It has to be weeded. Um, they have to often spray it. You can see here the remnants of weeds that were there in the winter, they've sprayed those weeds. And as that landscape comes on, they have to spray more. They also have to mow this area um, to keep it down low. So what you get from this landscape also is that if they're using herbicides or pesticides, they may get runoff as erosion comes down that hillside and carries it into the water system. This landscape may be providing a little bit of wildlife support. You may see some birds, you may see some other animals, but not much. All of these activities I mentioned don't really enhance ecological function in this landscape. It's contributing some. This landscape is contributing some, but not a lot. And I think this site illustrates some of the common issues that all of us confront. Um, things like it's really hard to grow turf grass and shade under established trees. We're looking at periods of drought. We get washouts and erosion and flooding. Um, sometimes areas are too steep to mow, so a traditional lawn really is not a great alternative there. This site also illustrates, I think, some of the aspirations we have for our landscapes. We want them to do more ecologically. We want to spend less time weeding. I'm all for a little zen weeding, um, don't get me wrong, but I also don't want to spend most of my resources on getting rid of weeds, and I want to mow less often. Um, so what can we do to address the, and reduce them out, to address these aspirations and these challenges and reduce the resources this landscape uses. And while we're adding ecological value, what we can do is cover the ground, but cover it with something that is low growing with minimal inputs and accomplishes all of these other points. We wanna reduce weed competition. We wanna increase the amount of stormwater that infiltrates into the soil profile. We wanna reduce erosion. Basically, we wanna supercharge our landscapes ecologically. So we wanna go beyond mulch and traditional turf grass. We wanna create um, a landscape that is low growing with minimal inputs and does all of these things, but creates a living mulch. And that's where grasses and sedges come in. And to understand how grasses and sedges contribute to this supercharged landscape, I think I wanna talk just a little bit about how they operate. How do grasses and sedges work? So uh, my time is limited, so I'm gonna try to do this quickly. I'm gonna cram a lot of information in this. So go quickly, we'll have time for questions at the end. I'm gonna run through 
understanding grasses and sedges, focus on a few specific grasses for covering the ground, um, but it'll go pretty quickly. Uh, so let me move ahead to that. And um, I'm not gonna cover the whole universe of things, so this will be fast and furious. So first of all, in understanding grasses and sedges, I'll start with what are grasses? Well, true grasses are in the family Poaceae. And it has the widest distribution of all our flowering plant families. You find it in the most areas throughout the terrestrial ecosystems. And grasses evolved millennia ago, really, um, and have adapted to survive in difficult conditions. So one of those adaptations is a different photosynthetic process, which I'll talk about shortly. And also they've evolved with highly efficient fibrous root systems, which become really important when we think about the functionality of those grasses. And in general, most of the grasses do best in full sun. There are some that do quite well in shade, but most of the grasses that you'll find commercially available really are full sun plants. Sedges, which are very grass-like and for most people kind of function like grasses, are mostly in the genus Carex or Carex, depending on where you did your training or uh, what you, where you went to school. But um, Carex are also distributed throughout the world. So this genus is really widespread. They also have fibrous root systems, but they tend to be um, less deep rooted than grasses. Grasses can go way down up to 15 feet in some cases, but uh, sedges tend to stay in the top, maybe six to eight inches of the soil profile, but they do have those really nice fibrous branching root systems. Sedges are all over the place. They range from shade loving uh, to sun tolerant. Most of the sedges I'll talk about today and most that are currently commercially available are mainly happiest in partial shade or partial sun to maybe full shade. Um, most of them are not full sun plants. Um, interestingly enough, even for this humongous genus, all of them are herbaceous perennials. Usually in very large genera, you see um, some, some species are woody, some are vines, some are herbaceous, but um, Carex, interest, interestingly enough, are all herbaceous perennials. And all of them are cool season growers. And what do I mean by that? Um, I think most of you in your training know about cool and warm season plants, but it's worth just spending a moment on um, to highlight that. Um, so cool season plants have use a C3 photosynthetic pathway. Um, they photosynthesize most efficiently when soil and air temperatures are relatively cool. So if we look at the growth cycle across, this is across the growing season of spring, summer, and fall. And uh, on this axis, we have the amount of growth. You'll see that cool season plants start to grow most actively in spring. They wake up early and they grow actively when the soil and air temperatures are cool. But as those temperatures drop and we move into summer, I'm sorry, as the temperatures rise, the photosynthetic pathway that they're on is a little less efficient. Um, so as the heat increases, they slow down. And in fact, in some sedges and some cool season plants, they go almost fully dormant in the middle of summer. Most of the plants I'll talk about today are not that way, but they do slow down quite a bit because that photosynthetic process is less efficient. They aren't able to put on as much, um, not able to create as much fuel for themselves and to, and to use the resources that are available as much. But as temperatures drop later on in the fall, they get a second flush of growth. Conversely, warm season grasses, they love the heat. So they're slow to start up with their top growth, but as the season heats up, they start to grow like crazy. They use a C4 photosynthetic process and that one is uber efficient at higher temperatures. And in fact, overall is more efficient. So this is the adaptation that grasses evolved with millennia ago, that, that C4 process. They use water and nutrients much more efficiently than cool season grasses do. And in fact, with the same amount of nutrients, water and sunlight, they can produce twice as much biomass as a cool season grass does. That's a big difference, but that's why most of the grasses that you see, especially in the, in the trade or available commercially, tend to be 
larger, they grow quickly because they use that different photosynthetic process. They are warm season growers. And they're putting most of their initial energy early in the season into root growth. Why is that important? Because that helps improve the site. Um, so grasses with their very fibrous root systems. Um, and you can see here, this system, this is a switch grass that was dug up. So it has roots that go much further down, but that root system and even the shallow one in sedges will help slow and filter runoff. So you get this thick crown, those roots go down into the soil profile and they help reduce erosion. They hold in soil, they store carbon. And the beauty of grasses and many of our sedges is that they function during dormancy. So even when they go dormant in the winter time, they keep their structure above ground. And many of our sedges are relatively um, evergreen. Even in the mountains here, they'll stay mostly evergreen. So they're continuing to slow down stormwater and function and hold the soil in even when they're dormant. In addition, because many of them have this crown that's thick and dense, they help reduce weed pressure as does this fibrous root system. So they really help in improving the site. In working with the soil and with grasses and sedges, most of them are tolerant of, of low fertility. That's especially the case with those warm season grasses that I've mentioned, because they are very efficient with nutrients and with sunlight. So they handle low fertility soils quite well. They don't tend to be fussy about pH. Um, they do appreciate good drainage. Um, that's something that really depends on the site and the grass. And don't really have the time to talk about that today, but it can matter. And it also has to do with the soil prep. So depending on the species, you may not need to amend the soil at all. Some of our prairie species of grasses are so efficient that actually adding nutrients, adding organic matter to the soil can cause them to grow very lushly, but they can flop over. Um, most of the plants I'll talk about today are going to be very low growing for reasons that will come clear, but, um, but they don't necessarily have that issue. But really it matters about soil prep depends on the species and depends on, on your site. Um, when you are planting both grasses and sedges, you really want to plant them at soil level. If you sink that plant, um, you invite sort of uh, lack of uh, air circulation, you get moisture into the crown and that can cause real problems for these plants. They really need to be planted at soil level a bit higher. Um, you can irrigate them to establish, but in general, especially with warm season growers, you don't need to irrigate much after that first year after establishment. And you will want to avoid late season planting with certain warm season grasses. Um, that applies more to some of our prairie species like uh, Muhlenbergia capillaris, pink muley grass, and um, some of the, uh, not many of the grasses I'll talk about today. Um, most grasses and sedges, there's a very short to-do list. Um, they usually don't need supplemental fertilizer irrigation, especially irrigation after the first year is usually not necessary, mostly pest and disease free. In terms of cutting back, grasses you want to do at once yearly in late winter before new growth starts. With sedges, because they're cool season growers, they're a little bit slower to recover from cutting back. So those you might do every two to three years, or you can do it every year if it's necessary because they don't look good. Um, and so that's something we can talk about if folks have questions. But I'll move on um, and talk about too, lastly, in this understanding section, Grasses and sedges are also part of building a plant community. So rather than thinking about individual plantings, we really wanna think about this in terms of what are we doing for building a plant community, an ecosystem. Sedges are hosts for pollinators, so are grasses. They're maybe not as obvious as some of our showy flowering species, but they are part of an ecosystem that supports pollinators. Uh, they provide nesting material and sites for birds and small mammals and deer tend to avoid them. And that's a big plus in most of our landscapes, especially in urban areas where we've been removing habitat for deer, um, especially grasses tend to be deer resistant. So, excuse me, now that we understand how grasses work, let's apply them to covering the ground. And I wanna start with this section, um, thinking about and for 
I won't have time to talk about all the wonderful grasses that are taller. So um, um, when Caroline and Charlotte, we talked about this, this initially this presentation, we're really gonna focus on covering the ground and plants that we can use as either lawn alternatives as ground covers or what I'll talk about matrix plantings as well. So let's get just a little bit of semantics out of the way. Um, when we're talking about large sweeps of the same plant, I tend to refer to that as either a ground cover or a lawn alternative. And within those large sweeps, for me, a ground cover is something that you probably don't mow. You maybe cut back once a year, but it's something that you let grow. And it might have a little bit of you know, undulation in it because it's not all cut the same height. So it's a little bit more visually variable in texture. A lawn alternative, I would say, is something that will tolerate mowing two to three times a year. You're gonna mow it high, maybe three to eight inches, and it might handle light foot traffic. And I'll note when um, the, the plants do that, when I talk about them. But essentially you're getting something that's relatively uniform. So a ground cover would be that maybe not mowed. Lawn alternative is something you might mow instead. So you get that more uniform look. Another way to think about covering the ground is what's been referred to as a planting matrix. And this has become really uh, to the forefront of progressive planting design, where if you look at these layers of a design plant community, and this is from uh, Thomas Rayner and Claudia West's book, Planting in a Post-Wild World. And here we're looking at this ground cover layer. So it may include other ground level species. I'm gonna talk about grasses and sedges here, but you're planting into that other herbaceous perennials that might be seasonally or blooming and provide a lot of the wow that you get from this layered planting and also a structural layer, but you're building a plant community. This ground cover layer is the really where you get your ecological function, you're controlling runoff, you're providing wildlife habitat, you're holding in the soil. This is these are what are referred to as the backup singers of the plant world. They're not the stars of the show. They're not what's popping in the color necessarily or providing that structure, but they are doing the work and unifying that planting, both visually and functionally. So it might be something very simple with where you're just under planting with a sedge here on the high line and making these other perennials pop. Um, this is um, at the Sassafras All Children's Playground in Raleigh, just a simple planting of prairie drop seed with these millennia, with these allium millennia popping up in there. Um, also, you can get really progressive about this, really complicated. These are layered planting communities that are doing things like managing stormwater. This is a bioretention planting in Denver. Um, and in Chicago, you can see these complex planting that are underpinned by that layer matrix planting of grasses and sedges. So now let's look at some of the meat of this. Let's look at some of the potential plants. So I'm gonna start with those for covering the ground in full sun. These are gonna be primarily grasses in this sense. And I'm just gonna hit some of the highlights. And as I'll tell you at the end, when I talk about resources, there are much bigger lists on our website available. So let's start with Aerogrostis spectabilis. Um, this is a lovely low growing, just a few inches, maybe eight to 12 inches tall, a warm season grass that um, has these airy pink little seed heads. It forms dense clumps and it's gonna spread somewhat slowly. Um, this one loves hot, dry conditions. Um, it's one of our native grasses that I think is underutilized. Um, you see it growing along roadsides and in fields. It's lovely and creates this cloud. Uh, at Sassafras All Children's Playground in Raleigh, they're using it as a ground cover in some of these areas where they don't want a lot of foot traffic. But believe me, their kids running across this. So it can handle light foot traffic, but not heavy foot traffic. And I wanted to show you what it looks like. Uh, in the winter time, this is fully dormant. This is in our uh, trial garden at the nursery. We have an area where we're trialing out these lawn alternatives. So this can be mowed, but it's unmowed here. Um, and the background is another sedge, Carex uh, flacca blue zinger. But this is what Aragrostis looks like when it's fully dormant. Um, with all these plants, I've got some information here that I'll pop up on the screen. There's a lot more online for you. I'm just gonna mention a few of the highlights or what are some of my favorite points about them. Uh, another native, um, which is native to the Midwest, so not North Carolina, is Budaloo gracilis, the blue grandma. 
This one again, full sun, dry conditions. It loves those rocky areas, pathways, um, really tough soils. Um, it can take light foot traffic. It has these really charming seed heads. I love them, but you can mow this one. Again, maybe three to eight inches in height. Uh, this is at the nursery where we had a planting. Uh, it's no longer there because we've renovated that garden. But I wanted you to see it across the timeline. So we planted very, very densely here. Um, you wouldn't have to plant this densely to get this kind of coverage. But this is in fall planting. Then in the spring, you can see it comes up bright green foliage. And in the summer, you get those little seed heads. And again, we didn't mow this, but you could mow that and get rid of those seed heads if you want a more tidy manicured look to it. Uh, and then, then in the fall, um, this is actually during a pretty dry year. This was back in, I've forgotten what year, maybe, uh, yeah, 2010, 2009. 2009. Uh, but you can see it's sort of dryish, but it's still doing pretty well for not having received irrigation. Here it is in the D Denver Botanic Garden. They have it as underplanting some of their display areas as well. A related species is Budaloidactyloides, also known as buffalo grass. This is one also native to um, the central region of North America, so not to North Carolina. It hasn't been used as much um, in the southeast, um, <clears throat> excuse me, but the evidence is pretty good that it should translate pretty well here. Uh, this is a planting from a study done by, at the time, a graduate student at NC State looking at um, using native landscape plants and native landscapes, and this was mowed regularly, um, again, to that higher height. You can see it has that nice, blue, nice bluish green color. Um, the One of the downsides of this one, depending on how you look at it, is that it is super drought tolerant, but what it will do to adapt to that drought is to go partially dormant if things get really difficult. So you can see in August, this one starts to get a little bit dry looking, a little bit brown, but it stayed lush, it's still alive, and it will bounce right back in the spring when you get more rainfall. Um, it goes fully dormant in winter time. So this is unmowed uh, in November, you can see that. We have it here at the nursery in this really nice planting um, that you can see. And then I'll finish up the full sun with talking about prairie drop seed. Um, this is a warm season grass, one of my favorite, has very fine texture and a mounding habit. It's a tidy enough looking plant that you can use it in almost any landscape, very manicured. You can use it in wilder landscape. You can see it here. Um, and uh, this is in the Lori garden as that matrix planting. What I find interesting is you can see here in, um, it is native mostly to the middle part of the US and into Canada, but there is a small population in North Carolina um, in Serpentine Barren. So it's sort of technically a native, but most often found in the Midwest. It is fantastic as an underplanting, as this also is more, so matrix planting on the left, more as big sweeps. This is at Chanticleer Garden in Pennsylvania, just absolutely breathtaking as a large sweep and has outstanding fall color. All right, so I'm going to now look at mostly sedges. We're going to look at partial sun and shade. Um, I've got a lot of plants to cover in a small time, so I'm going to just hit the highlights and we can talk about them too if you have questions. Um, our best seller by far of our native sedges is Pennsylvania sedge. It is an uh, Eastern North American native. Um, you find it in these beautiful sweeps, carpet-like sweeps, especially in the mountains, uh, because that's where it's really happiest is in cooler climates. It's one of the few sedges in the trade right now that has that really carpety rhizomatous spread to it. We're investigating other sedges that we hope may be more heat tolerant and even take full sun, but the trade is not quite there yet as we're, we're getting more into native sedges. Um, Carex Pennsylvanica doesn't really handle foot traffic. Uh, I want to show it to you here. And this is actually at the nursery. So this is in the Piedmont of North Carolina. In the spring, it looks fantastic. By the end of the summer, it gets a bit tired looking, especially if we've had droughty conditions. But it does handle dry. It's just not going to look fantastic. And it's not going to be as lush and gorgeous as it is in cooler areas of North Carolina, but it is a great alternative for dry shade. Um, uh, Dale Batchelor, who's paced here in the Piedmont, 
and works a lot with native plants as a designer shared this photo with me. Uh, this is more toward Western North Carolina and the mountains, but she's used it beautifully here. Carex divulsa is a Eurasian species that to me is one of the best sedges for underneath established trees. Uh, this is at Duke Gardens where you can see this really nice tidy habit. Um, it handles a range of soil conditions. I really wish it were a native sedge because I love it so much and I, I tend to prefer natives, especially my home landscape, but this one handles heat and humidity really well. Um, it has this tidy habit. Uh, you can see it at the Museum of Art in Raleigh. They've used it actually in mostly sun plantings in the parking lot where it's doing quite well. Eventually these trees will provide a canopy and the Carex also will adapt to that change and become more of a shady plant. It's also found um, in Raleigh along Glenwood Avenue. They've used it as this underplanting again, under established trees so that over time as those trees get larger, it will adapt to shadier conditions. Carex texensis is a southeastern native and not just in Texas, it's throughout the southeast. Uh, that is another sedge with very fine textured foliage. Again, these are the backup singers. They're not the stars, but this is a drought tolerant one that's adapted um, to, it'll adapt to shade, some sun, um, for a lot of these sedges, as you push them more toward full sun, they will benefit from having moisture conditions. So I wouldn't put one of these native sedges in full sun and dry, bump up, you know, balance that moisture more with the sunny conditions. And that's what you're really looking at. Um, in New England, for example, or the, even the Mid-Atlantic, where they have cooler nighttime temperatures, cooler conditions, they can put some of these sedges in full sun and they're okay. But here in the Southeast, we have to balance them with more moisture. And most of these are just not full sun plants for us. Carex Sixensis is planted um, on Duke's campus. They've used it on under planting. You can see here um, underneath these big trees and woody shrubs as they're living mulch. And that's where it's really doing a great job. You can see it dormant um, here in late winter, or excuse me, early spring and in the summertime. And then here, rather than trying to grow traditional turf grass, which doesn't grow well in shade, they've put it underneath these established trees. So moving on, there's a little bit taller sedge, Cherokee sedge. This is one of the toughest ones in our trial gardens. Um, it is very deer resistant. This one will form colonies. It reseeds and it spreads rhizomatously. Um, you find it in both shady conditions. It will handle more sun, but it will grow taller. Um, I've included this photo uh, from Duke Gardens, their spring Lubinland garden, because they've put it on this slope to help control erosion. And this is in the winter time. So fully dormant, we still get this plant that's mostly mostly evergreen um, and is really doing a great job. My caveat with this one is that it will spread. It can be um, a bit of a bully in a very dense planting because it grows pretty big. It's a vigorous grower and it can spread. So you really want this one in a tough spot um, where it will, that might tamp down some of the growth or put it in an area where you want it to spread, but it is super tough. This, this is at the um, North Carolina Arboretum in Asheville where they've used it in full sun because it can handle that with the cooler climate. All right, so moving on, cause I'm running out of time, but I wanna cover just a few more and look at some resources is um, one of my favorite sedges because it's so lush and beautiful is uh, Carex Bunny Blue. This one has beautiful blue-green foliage, nice texture, and it's tougher than it looks. It looks like it's this delicate thing, very lush and beautiful, but it really handles both wet and dry conditions. We put this one in rain gardens because it can handle wet and dry. Um, a similar sedge is Carex flacosperma, uh, which I'll talk about as well. Very similar, just a little bit different range. Um, this is bunny blue in my home landscape. And I wanted to show you, this is uh, late winter, very early spring when it's blooming. I haven't cut this one back and I feel, think it still looks great. This is at the Brooklyn Botanic Garden, Carex flacosperma in December. So really handling those tough conditions. And I'll throw in a, a grass here that is Cessillary autumnalis. That is a cool season grass. 
that one of the few that does well in shady conditions. Um, it's a European native and um, has these really charming little seed heads. And I'll show you here. In full sun, it can start to yellow out. So it's one in the Southeast I'd use only in shade. And then the last plant I'll talk about is the Carex Evercolor series. Again, these are sedges, cool season growers. This is a colorful series. So these are not really the backup singers. These are, um, this is an Asian species that if you want some bling in your shady landscapes or in partial sun, this is where you'll get it. Um, I'll just mention that there are several cultivars available with lots of different colors. They pop, especially in shady conditions. They're good growers, vigorous growers. Um, they'll make a great ground cover. And so you can cover that ground. So in wrapping up the plants, when we're covering the ground and we're going beyond traditional turf grass or mulch, when we're supercharging our landscape, when you're doing that ecologically, grasses and sedges offer these smart solutions. They really are the new workhorses of the garden. And so let me wrap up last section here with just a few resources I want to mention. Our website, which I invite you to explore because we've packed it with all kinds of information. Every plant I've talked about today has a full profile with tips on growing it, using it in the landscape, more photos. Um, and in addition, we have plant selection tools that will let you select for lawn alternatives and for low growing plants. So there are a lot more plants that could have been on this list on the handout and just didn't have time. Also, I'd invite you to explore, explore and uh, nerd out with me in our learn section because that's where we packed a lot of information there, um, especially in our resources section, there are lists of publications, um, books that we use and refer to all the time. I will note, because we're only a wholesale nursery, we really can't take any inquiries um, from the public or from master gardeners. And I, I wish we had the resource to answer all your questions there or on the phone, but we just don't. If you're interested in purchasing these plants, the place to go is to your local garden center. Ask for them. They may not have them right now. We're trying to work on that. And we're hoping we can get our customers to sell more to them, but um, ask at your local garden center. Or um, if you need to get liners, Izell native plants, um, Izell is online. They will also ship a few non-natives if we ask nicely. If you ask nicely, they'll do that. I highly recommend them. They're great folks. And they source from a number of different wholesale nurseries and get liners. Just to touch on a few um, particular books, and these are on the handout that is available in the chat. And also um, you can see them on our website. This is our grass Bible. Um, these are a couple of, of resources for looking specifically at lawn alternatives. I mentioned progressive planting design. These are some of the books we use. These are folks who know grasses and such as well and are working with them. I also mentioned a few um, covering the ground. Uh, on the handout, I mentioned a few companion perennials. Uh, these are a few that I love and know and work really well with these grasses and sedges. And then I'll wrap up with inviting you to um, investigate the Perennial Plant Association. This is a professional organization that connects professionals in the perennial plant industry. We provide education, we promote perennials. So there are people there who have bred some of these exciting cultivars that are out there that select these plants that you see commercially that are really shaping what happens with perennials. Um, as noted, I'm on the board and I invite you to join us we have an upcoming event, uh, July 27th through 29th. We're doing a virtual national symposium. So there will be perennial plant experts speaking literally from across the world. So we'll be joining together uh, for doing that. So you can get information and register at perennialplant.org. Also at Hoffman Nursery, we're gonna be hosting as part of this, we're doing a hybrid national symposium where we'll have in-person pop-up events um, across the US and there's one close to you. Hoffman Nursery is going to be hosting one on Thursday, September 16th. So with that, I will say thank you very much for your attention. And I think we have just a couple of minutes probably to um, answer questions. So I will stop sharing. Oh, Shannon, thank you so much. That was terrific. Um, I know we all appreciate the handout. You went right along with that. I was scribbling my notes and thinking about my landscape and I know that 
the buildup that you gave us to thinking about the layers has really got people looking at different trouble areas um, in a new way. Right. We have a couple of little questions. Um, people sure. are wondering about rabbits. You mentioned deer resistance for some of them. Um, what's your experience with rabbits? Rabbits, yes. And that's actually I'm, where I live, rabbits and voles are the biggest problem. So what we find with, and I find with sedges, is they do get nibbled, especially that brand new growth in early spring when obviously there are not as many plants growing, but they tend to recover pretty quickly because what I've found, and I've watched it virtually or from my home office the last couple of springs in particular, they'll nibble that new growth, but as other plants become available, sedges are actively growing in that time and they're gonna get lots of new growth. So typically they recover pretty quickly. And as other more palatable species start growing, they move off of it. So I've had mine nibbled this spring, but already I can't really tell. Grasses, rarely do rabbits mm -hmm. nibble them. Again, it's that tender new growth, but the grasses are typically waking up, breaking dormancy and actively growing much later in the season. So usually there are other more palatable species available for them. So mm -hmm. we don't find it to be a big problem for, with rabbits. That is very good news given the yeah. rabbit population. Oh gosh. Oh gosh. How about folks with dogs wondering if there's a suggestion or can they handle dog foot traffic, you know? Well, as with, you know, humans, well, the answer is heavy foot traffic, no, they're just not going to do that. So as you know, you'll get those worn pathways. That's what they can't handle is continuous foot traffic. So I, I can't pretend. Yeah. that they can they handle that. And, and that's where it goes toward design and doing things that we know work. For example, just planting around. If your dogs have circuits, um, mm -hmm. I know some, some designers actually specialize in, in you know, sort of pet friendly landscapes. And often you really have to just plan around their typical pathways and allow for that. Um, but Good point. not, not really, they're not going to handle because that can, especially if they're in a habit, the grass just can't, can't handle that. I, I yeah. wish I could say yes, but not so much. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Um, what if you never cut them back? If you've got a steep slope and you're, you put them in for erosion control and it's really difficult to mow, um, how do they do if you never cut them back? It's a great question because, you know, people always say, well, do you have to cut them back? Because in nature, you know, they don't get cut back. Well, what can happen? So with grasses and sedges, both more so with grasses, sometimes they can get a lot of thatch in, in that crown. And so what often does happen too, and, and I'm, that's, I'll try not to go off on the many tangents that are now occurring to me, but often, especially with grasses, um, they tend to, because so many evolved in grasslands where they had, you know, um, were uh, grazed. That's the word I was looking uh, for. Yeah. You know, they're, you, they actually evolved to be cut back a little bit. So even in nature, you're going to see them getting um, cut back. And in our managed landscapes, they're not. Um, I realize that kind of fights against what I said about them being deer resistant, but deer are different than things like other grazing animals cattle that's not things, really yes. true actually but where i'm going with this is that often in our managed landscapes we don't have the same pressures they're not getting burned back so fire is being suppressed there are a lot of management technique management techniques that happen naturally that don't occur in our managed landscapes but i'll say they should do fine but i think they may not match the manicured or the look that most of us most folks want in a managed landscape because you'll get a lot of, um, you'll get some of the old foliage that's there. Um, that will increase thatch. You may have lower survivability over time because that dense crown can invite disease pressures, you know, or you have more disease pressures there. And you may get more creatures being really happy about having a little warm spot to, to um, hang out in. So if you can mow, even with, you know, if it's using a string trimmer or if you have the ability to mow, I would say you want to do that. If you can do that every three to five years, you're going to be able to, to have that landscape function better um, in that case. I, 
Does that that's kind of answer ex- yeah. it? That's that a great explanation. Probably spend a half hour on that. And folks who manage landscapes may have more to add to that too than I do. There may be folks here who have done this themselves. That's true. Could you quickly speak to voles? You mentioned voles. Have you got any other um, thoughts on the, how, how they disrupt them? They don't, I have not, in my home landscape, but also at the nursery, we haven't seen them actively going after the root systems because that's where the disruption happens, right? Is that they're going after and eating the root systems. Um, as I said, I'm in, I'm in an established home neighborhood. My home neighborhood is established plantings. We are rife with voles and they've eaten many things from the root up. And so you pull up the plant and there's nothing left. I can say I've never had that happen with a grass or a sedge. But what can happen is as they're foraging for other plants, they can disrupt, you know, they can, they can, you know, uh, heave, you get heaving in the ground. But I will say one of the advantages of the dense plantings I'm talking about, so I didn't really go into that much, but if you let your plants be your mulch and you're planting densely and having those layered plantings, the voles have less cover. They love mulch. They love to go mm. down underneath that. And I find that they're less wont to enter those layered landscapes than if I've just got a mulch layer there. Okay. Um, now, I'm, I don't want to say that as a principle, but I found that they don't tend to be, they don't tend to go after them, the grasses and sedges to eat, but they can disrupt them. But planting densely seems to help with that. Okay, good advice. Someone is wondering if any of these could be planted from seed successfully. Sedges are tough. Um, most of them um, need cold stratification. Mm -hmm. And so in a landscape planting, that's very challenging to do. Um, we have to go through a protocol. In fact, there's some of these where we need six months lead time in order to grow them because of cold stratification. Now, of course, I mentioned Cher Carex cherokeeensis, with re which reseeds on its own. Um, that's fine, but in terms of being able to count on it, sedges are very difficult to do in the landscape. Um, some of the grasses will grow just fine, so you might try that with something like Aragrostis spectabilis, um, um, the prairie drop seed is a little bit tougher, so the 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 um, germination varies quite a bit, um, and that's where we. I and we as a nursery have far less experience with that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And I think lastly, just a question about if someone's got a sweep of carex, how can they handle weed control in that area? Ah, well, weed control is always going to be something you'll have to do. So what we're trying to do is mitigate that or reduce the amount of it. So I'm going to go back to ideally you're planting and maybe you're, you're mulching initially, which is totally fine, mulch it. I usually plant into the mulch. Um, you wanna make sure you've got ground contact, not too much mulch around the, plant, the crown of the plant. So that initial planting, and that's where that first one to two years, you really are going to have to be vigilant about controlling weeds and hand weeding. Um, if you're, the more densely you're planting, the less of that you're gonna to have to do. And over time, as those sedges fill in, you will still do have to do some spot weeding. Um, I can't pretend that you're not going to be weeding with this technique. And so, but if you've got a planting that's overrun, um, that's where the challenge becomes if you've got both broadleaf um, weeds in there and other grasses, that's where I don't have a great solution. Um, and, and so that's where um, selective herbicides could be part of that. Um, ideally, you're doing that from the beginning and managing it. And I wish I had a snap answer, but I don't. No, nope, no, nope. that's perfectly practical and the truth. That's what we need. It is. There's so still you plan correctly happened. Yeah. from the beginning. Sure. Well, Shannon, I want to say thank you so much. I know we're going to be receiving so many great comments about this presentation and, um, and, and I uh, really appreciate your time and, and uh, just a fantastic job. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks. And wishing all of you great grasses. Thank you. Thank you. That was excellent. So in inspirational. And I've got lots of notes and ideas and things to try. 
Um, we're going to move over now to our bolos. So we welcome Matt and Mike. And I'm not sure which one of you guys is going to be up first, but um, you should be able to share now. Thanks, Charlotte. I'm going to go up first uh, this time. And I'm going to go through this fairly quickly so we can get time to hear about your plants as well. Um, let me share my screen. Okay, I'm assuming everyone can see that. All right, um, so get out your annotation tools. And uh, I'd like to just know one question is, have you seen periodical cicadas yet? So um, if you're, please put a little mark or a stamp or something on the county if you've seen them. I'm just curious where people are seeing them. I have a lot of folks on Twitter that I'm seeing sharing things, especially up in Maryland, um, Pennsylvania, southeastern Pennsylvania, and up along West Virginia areas like that. So I'm just curious if anybody's seen them yet. Um, they should be mostly out in the very western edge of the state. So I'm not sure if we also have listeners on there. And I see there's a chat maybe. Um, so Wilkes County. You know, Matt, uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I don't know if we have annotate activated. You oh, know, okay. I, I think uh, we may have deactivated it. Oh, <laughs> so that's all right. If folks aren't having any luck finding that, usually it's up under the view options. But if you okay. don't see it, we may actually have it turned off. Okay. Well, um, sorry if, about if, that. If not, that's all right. That's all right. Yeah, just throw it in the chat. I see Wilkes County, um, seen two in Asheville. So, um, yeah. Northern in Northern Virginia. Okay, great. So yep, they're out. Uh, so they're out making noise and whatnot. They'll probably be out for another couple weeks, and then uh, they're gonna be silent again as they die off and get eaten. Uh, and their babies are in the little twigs uh, laid in the twigs by the females. Those babies will then hatch out um, this season, drop to the ground, tap into the roots of the trees, and it's gonna be another 17 years before they're out again. So um, if you see them, you know, you're pretty lucky actually in some respects, especially in North Carolina, because it's not a very widespread brood. Okay, well, I'm gonna keep moving so we have time. Um, so just some bolos, uh, insect bolos for June. So lots of young caterpillars. Uh, you're gonna have small bagworms uh, right now. You can see all these bagworms just taken off of this one little branch. Um, and so, Go out and check, uh, smack some branches on some paper, look for these little tiny kind of cones that are made up of little bits of debris from the plants. Um, that can uh, signal you have an infestation. Uh, so take a look, this is the best time to treat too when they're very small. Uh, even some tiny webworms you may start seeing in, uh, in June. So these fall webworms, which are, you know, it's not fall, it's, it's gonna be summer, but they're starting, they're small, starting very small little web colonies, which will get larger as the summer progresses until you notice them a lot more at the end of, uh, end of the season. You may start seeing some more sawflies as well. So these look like caterpillars, but are not. They're gonna grow up into be little primitive wasps. Um, and they can be told, as you all know, I tell you all this time, all this, all the time. Uh, they can be told by having six or more pairs of pro legs without little hooks on them. They have a single eye lens. So they have, I think they look a little cuter than caterpillars because it looks like cartoonish uh, rather than the little tiny crescent uh, set of eyes on caterpillars. They typically also don't have a lot of CD all over their body. They're usually like bumps and uh, little spikes or things like that. Of course, this is the time of year too when the Japanese beetles are have developed, they've pupated, and they're going to begin to emerge and mate and feed. Uh, the adult Japanese beetles will feed on a variety of hosts, but we especially see them on roses, other rosaceae like prunus species, and uh, things like grapes. But they do feed on a lot of different hosts. Um, and of course, um, this is the time to treat for the adults. Uh, they'll be out for a little while and mate and lay eggs and then die. And then those eggs in the soil will become small grubs, which in the fall become a little bit more large. Um, and uh, for places where you have high populations, that may be the best time to treat for grub control. Although we, we typically see them only sporadically causing damage. 
lots of bugs are coming out, um, lots of lace bugs, uh, flea hoppers, uh, leaf hoppers, things like that are very active right now. Um, you know, getting into the swing of things, feeding on plants, causing damage. Um, so check out your herbs, check out your vegetables, all those things. Uh, for the vegetables that really just got caused damage to the, the leaves. Uh, but for herbs, of course, uh, they, they take out a lot of the, the green or green parts and make them less desirable to use, uh, especially uh, leaf hoppers and flea hoppers. This uh, flea hoppers like this one right here. Uh, the tiger bee flies are going to be out. Uh, so don't be afraid when you see these giant buzzing black flies. Uh, they are harmless to people. Uh, though they are very deadly to carpenter bees. So this one actually emerged from a carpenter bee nest to my old, uh, my deck before it was taken down um, and replaced. And uh, I actually am rearing a carp, uh, one of these larvae uh, that was found by a colleague on a carpenter bee larva that was uh, in a nest uh, split open for research. So I'm looking forward to uh, having it develop into the beautiful adult that will be a good biocontrol of carpenter bees. Of course, be on the lookout for all of the blood sucking uh, arthropods. So this is gonna be, we're getting into high tick season and mosquito season, of course. Uh, so protect yourself out there. Um, things like the Lone Star Tick are a very aggressive biter um, and attached to humans. Luckily, they, they don't transmit many serious diseases though they can be the cause of alpha gal allergy, meat allergies. Um, Mosquitoes are typically more of a nuisance than a disease spreader here in the US, but uh, it's always good to be safe. And of course, there's just gonna be everything else. So, you know, it's hard to predict what's gonna be out there, but basically everything's active now. The temperature's warming up. Uh, we set out a light at a friend's house the other night and found lots of really cool little critters. So you may see some of these things uh, crawling around, uh, flying around, jumping around your yards and your homes. So if you're not sure what they are, please let us know um, and we'll, we'll help you out. And that's all I have uh, for now. So, and I'll see if there are any questions in the chat. In the chat. Let's see. Okay. All right, Mike, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, your turn now. <laughs> All right, can everyone hear me? Yes, we do. One, two, three. Good. I had a little bit of a problem with my microphone earlier this morning, but I just written it out here. So let me um, just mention for those of you who may be new to this that BOLO is our shorthand for be on the lookout, <clears throat> some borrowed government term. And it's the time when we present the things that you may be seeing in the next month. Although because of the way that the program is structured, we don't have much time to go into any kind of control measures. It's you know, very brief, if, if at all. But um, you can contact us if you have questions about those if they, if they do come up. Let me, before I uh, actually start my bolos, I want to share a different screen here. When when you talked about the sawflies, you showed those sawflies, and I have two things. One is I thought of uh, I thought of the rose slug sawflies in the, the holes that we'll start seeing in the in the rose leaves, but I also thought of of this that you know would these be saw they don't really have pro legs they don't have pro legs, but it's just that one eye spot there that kind of caught my attention. It, uh, talk about the simple eye. All right, let's now talk about diseases here. So I am very grateful that we got almost three tenths of an inch of rain at home last night. My friend and coworker here, Chuck Hodges, says he got two inches. He lives close to the art museum here on the west side of Raleigh. I live in Garnet. So finally some, some good rainfall, but we'll have to wait and see <coughs> how it's all developed and we need to start seeing some success. The presentation even there has some to have some water at establishment here. Uh, definitely food for trees and shrubs as well. So it can be a lot more for that need in your, in your landscape. Another general thing to be careful for, we are sooty molds. 
So generally dark, fine by loading surfaces, the upper river is leaves, kind of a patchy or regular pattern, sometimes following the veins where it's washed off. And this is, of course, the development of secondary fungi on honeydew dripping down from insects feeding in either the same tree or shrub or an overstory tree or shrub and dripping down on these leaves. So there's, uh, unless it's extremely thick, there's no harm done to the, the plant in question. And you can diagnose this quite easily by just rubbing off the, the coating with uh, a little pressure between your thumb and forefinger. If it comes off, then that is what you have as sooty mold. And I haven't seen much yet, but it's actually been a while since I saw the first oligoseptica, the dog vomit slime mold of the year on mulch beds. So get a little bit more rain and I expect we'll be seeing quite a bit more of this, especially on the fairly pressure mulches in the landscapes. Oops, sorry. As far as our trees and shrubs in, uh, in June, always be work, looking for Phytophthora and Armillaria root rods. So we're looking to see what happens with Phytophthora. We had a very wet winter, and so that would favor the development of the, of the pathogen in the root systems, and then it turned dry, which would cause stress to the rest of the season. So we have to look at any plants that are in general declining, wilting, uh, trees and shrubs, that you want to make sure that the roots are not compromised. And in our area, very often that's by doctor or with a true fungus or malaria. Nematodes, keep those in mind really any time of year, especially on boxwood. That's our number one shrub that we see it on. But as we talked about last month, you can get it on azalea as well, the stunt nematodes. And you may see it on gardenia, Japanese holly, a few other shrubs as well. And canker dieback diseases, we did in the presentation last month talking about azalea, we talked about Phomopsis canker, but there are others such as Ceridium canker pictured here, generally just the tips of the Leyland cypress and not always, but oftentimes having a kind of an orange color to it where the needles have died after beyond the point where it was girdled by the fungus. Another Fungus or group of fungi, what we generally call Bacchusperia. You can get on rhododendron as well as on Leyland. And those were going to kill larger branches, not just the, the tips. On the far right here, you'll see um, something that may be very common on our Japanese maples, especially, but we have Philostic, the leaf spot, and also anthracnose, two fungal diseases that have similar symptoms. You see now, they probably will do on crepe myrtle, on dogwood, on euonymus, of course. Um, Leucothui is an interesting one. I haven't taken a nurse sample. I have, but um, the interesting thing about that is at least get red spots on when they have harder nutrient. So if you see red spots on Leucothui leaves, turn that over and see if you see the powdery mildew sign on the other side. Rose and Sardia, two other Leucothui aware of the fact that powdery interview could be headed your way. Jim Brangium rusts. We are now in the phase where we'll be seeing the fruit and stem inspections on our cavity bears, the boss centered bear photograph, and on Silversberry. With the oak tree, I haven't noticed oak blister yet this year, but it's become more noticeable as those spots, the infection occurred this spring when the leaves were tender. And as the spots start to die out and die out, you get the, the dark color, see it in the lower right there, and it gives the impression that it's still spreading. But the, the infection process all that occurred while in the back end. It's just uh, the depth of the tissue that you're noticing. And finally, of course, rose rosette is something that, that you can have at any time in, in your rose dishes. Just a few on the fruits with peach. Upper left photograph there is scab. So that's something you can see on the fruit when it's, when it's young and it may crack as it expands because the infected portions are not, gonna, are not gonna grow. As the fruit matures later on, we'll start to see the brown rot, the fruit phase of brown rot, which is a different fungus. But that is not going to really advance until that fruit gets some maturity to it. 
fire blight on apple. Right now, it would be the nice bright orange and, and blue on the leaves. And uh, I'm just see the the fire blight, of course, got the, the ambush pigs sometimes with that shepherd's crooklet. And there's these the fog eye leaf spot, which is a different looking spot on the leaves, but the same fungus that causes acrobat of fruit. If you're growing, Blackberries, cane blight is something to be on the lookout for as far as rust this season and viruses being in the back or lower left. With grapes, herbicide entry on the musket vines and the bunch grapes. And the musket is extremely sensitive to herbicides, so uh, warm leaves there, that should be your first suspicion. And the bunch grapes, you may be seeing some down mildew again, turning out the global growth for the, in this case, the water. The vegetables are really going to happen at this point and so will their problems very soon. Of course, lots of man rot, especially those first clusters that aren't getting calcium to them. Uh, these shots may see a bacterial response if you got a transplant that were infected and uh, septoria fungal infection. That is going to be into more in lower leaves. Whereas the spotting for the native spotted wilt virus, as you see here in the upper left, it's going to be more, or wilt will be possibly seen in the very youngest folks. So that is what you would expect, suspect, or seasoning like that photograph there. Uh, the warmer weather, well, of course, you can have root not in episodes coming in, and the warmer weather kind of uh, doesn't expect it too much until things shut, but the bacterial wilt could have been other in light. Back to base in the dams as well. So, he's a method to look thing. Those three things we want to check out. And herbicide area that you mentioned before with, with tomatoes. In the cucurbis, downy mildew, it's always not known each year when it's going to show up in North Carolina from the south. Could be late, maybe early June. You know, seeing in the case of the cucumber leaves, the Angular yellow spot that then die out, and the sporation of that again, the inside is going to have a little bit of a kind of a grayish color to it. Anthracnose, any stem blights, and and nematodes are other things to watch for on the cucurbits. It's a photograph there of the lower left of uh, us and cucumber roots with the fruit pack. Nice to ask another vegetable. I guess it is a vegetable. We did a party. Will be something to be looking for as well. Kind of patchy yellowish on the top, and that's the grayish or delayed on the other side when we have good conditions for that element. So that's a good way. Well, our best four of things that you want to be looking for fairy ring, any month, any kind of turf. And again, there are multiple manifestations of it. Sometimes it's a green ring like photographed here. Other times that ring may be uh, drying out, dead, necrotic. And other times you'll actually get the mushrooms or puffballs showing up in the full ring or in an arc of it. So it won't be long and we'll start seeing those coming up once we get the rings. Dollar spot, I think we've asked this before about the difference between a spot and a, and a patch. So a spot would be four inches or less in diameter, although in the case of dollar spot, they can get larger than that. So something that could happen on uh, your picking bluegrass or your ryegrass. And on tall fescue, as well as ryegrass, this is gonna be the season for brown patches. The weather gets warm and humid. The photograph in the lower left was taken on campus where they had a mixed planting. It's not this way anymore. They had a mixed planting of the fescue and some, I think it was zoysia there, in strips. And that was uh, the part that was affected by the brown patch was, was just the fescue. And I tossed in one kind of just an interest for those who are up in the mountains, the red thread, where you get these very light colored depth of the, of the grass blades, and a, maybe a pinkish cast to it. And if you look closely, you may see these they say antler-like sclerotia, red sclerotia of the fungus that causes this. So that one is not that common, but it's very distinctive if you do happen to see it. And with that, I will stop sharing and 
check out the chats. Not too much in the chat, Mike. Um, Matt addressed a soldier fly issue, and then um, someone was asking about the treatment for maple anthracnose, so I sent them a fact sheet and sent it to everyone. All right, thank so you. So I think we're caught up. Very good. Thank you. All right, back to you, Charlotte. All right, thank you, Mike. Um, okay, I should have my screen share should be up for the plant these instead feature and um, this month we are going to be talking about some invasive vines that you don't want to plant and what you can plant instead. So if you've been walking along, especially the edge of the woods, anywhere that's kind of low or wet lately, you probably smelled something really sweet. And um, it was most likely Japanese honeysuckle. So this is a, a, a non-native vine, which you can tell by the common name, Lanisra japonica, which is um, a, a very common invasive species found throughout natural areas in North Carolina. Um, it is currently in bloom, but the reason we don't want it is because it is invasive, meaning, you know, a lot of times as gardeners, we might say something's invasive when we mean it's weedy and it kind of just comes up all over the garden. But in this sense, we're talking about a species that um, spreads readily into native areas and takes over native communities, displacing that native vegetation and it disrupts the whole habitat. So these are the plants we really want to avoid. Um, planting and we want to, if you have and are able to control them in natural areas in your yard, you want to try to take measures to control them and get rid of them. So Japanese honeysuckle is definitely one of the most common invasive vines we see in natural areas throughout the eastern United States. A few others you'll want to avoid that you probably have seen as well, these wisteria species. There's actually two wisterias, but they can both be invasive, the wisteria sinensis and wisteria floribunda. Um, later in the year, sweet autumn clematis, there's actually uh, three, at least three species of clematis that go under that common name. So you, you want to look closer at the scientific name, clematis turniflora is the invasive sweet autumn clematis, also sometimes called Japanese clematis. Um, it's, it's also very sweet fragrant and it just covers things and um, then it has these seed heads and the seeds disperse and um, it spreads around. And then last of all, English ivy. Sometimes grown as a ground cover, sometimes as a vine, it will start growing up the trees and growing all over everything. So these are things to avoid using um, because of their potential to move into natural areas and disrupt them and displace those natural communities. So what can you plant instead? Well, there's a whole lot of stuff that you can explore in the plant toolbox. There are 209 different, I mean, 206 different vines listed. And to find those vines, if you go to the find a plant, um, option and then go um, where it says whole plant traits. I think you can see my pointer now. Um, and under plant type, one of the things you can click on is vine. And that will give you 206 different options. Um, but you can narrow that down a lot more by clicking on many of these different, uh, these other things that you can select to find plants and narrow down your choices. You can say, I want something that's for a specific region, or I want something that will grow in sun or shade or specific type of soil. I'm trying to attract certain wildlife or avoid certain challenges. Um, if you're only looking for native, you can turn on the, the native setting under the landscape theme. So there's a whole lot of things that you can do to, to narrow down your choices to find the right plant for your site. So we got a quick preview of one of the, the alternatives I'm gonna suggest. So let's look at some of these things, just a, a few things from the plant toolbox that you can plant instead. Um, we do have a native honeysuckle, the coral honeysuckle, and this is Um It may be in the Western part of the state, it's still blooming, but I know here in the Piedmont, it, the, the main spring bloom is over, but it will tend to throw out some blooms throughout the summer. Um, this one is not fragrant, but it is beautiful with these coral red flowers and um, it, it tends to bloom about the time the hummingbirds are coming back in, so the hummingbirds really like it. And it, it is fairly evergreen unless we have a really cold winter. It'll grow in sun to part shade. It, it will definitely climb. It's a vigorous vine, like most vines or vines in general are adapted to climb. That is their whole purpose. They're trying to go to the sunlight. So if you keep vines in more sun, they don't tend to stretch as much. They don't, maybe they'll stay a little more compact, but they're still, most of them are going to be fairly vigorous growers. So you need a pretty good structure for this to grow on. Um, and it's just a, a really lovely vine. 
um, to bring in um, hummingbirds. And then later on after the flowers, it can have these little berries that some of our songbirds will feed on. Um, so a beautiful spring blooming vine um, that will bring lots of beauty to your yard. Um, a couple of others, and these also happen to be natives. We have some really nice native vines in the eastern United States. If you're going for fragrance, the Carolina jessamine, um, which has the yellow blooms, one of the one of the earliest um, of our natives to bloom as well, our native woody plants, um, Gelsimium sempervirin, sempervirin referring to evergreen, so it is fairly evergreen. Um, and then the yellow flowers usually come out in March um, and are very, very fragrant. Um, so that is uh, another option, another really vigorous grower, as well as cross vine. Cross vine is uh, a little bit later to bloom, usually late April, early May. And um, this one we see in the picture is a cultivar named Tangerine Beauty, selected by the J.C. Ralston Arboretum. Uh, the wild form has more of a yellow and red flower, um, and it's, it's quite beautiful too. But um, if you want this, this kind of peachy apricot color, look for the Tangerine Beauty cultivar. There's other varieties out there as well. Um, this is another one the hummingbirds like. The bees love it. I've seen this covered in bees. And um, another vigorous grower. So these need pretty sturdy structures. You see the Carolina jessamine here on a, a metal fence. Um, the cross vine can definitely grow and climb to 10 feet if you have that space for it to grow. Um, so just keep that in mind that, that many of our vines, especially our native vines, are, are pretty vigorous growers. If you are looking for something that's a little smaller, that's going to maybe be okay on your mailbox without devouring it, um, or just like a small tripod, I would point you toward the clematis species. So we have both, uh, there's actually many different species of clematis. Most of the time we think of these large flowered hybrid clematis, like you see here, there's a purple and a white one. The white one's probably Henry Eye. Um, and there, there's a lot of these lovely colors, full range of colors um, available. Most of them will stay, you know, they'll get to be about five or six feet and they die back in the winter. So you use, for, for most of our clematis, not all of the species anyway, you would cut them back um, to leave a few buds uh, in, in late winter. Um, there are some of the early spring blooming ones that you would not cut back. So you, before you cut back your clematis, you want to really know what you've got and how to care for it. Um, so you don't cut off any potential uh, bloom buds. But um, our hybrid clematis are very popular um, and fairly adaptable. They like uh, kind of a, a richer soil and, and somewhere that's a little bit moist but not too wet. Um, if you are looking for something a little different from clematis, you can seek out some of the species clematis. And I've highlighted just a couple here that are actually native to the southeastern United States. There's what's called the swamp clematis or marsh clematis, clematis crispa, but it doesn't need to grow in a swamp. And um, you'll find it, especially in the eastern part of North Carolina, it's quite fragrant, quite a lemony fragrance. It's blooming right now and it has these little kind of bell-shaped flowers with curved back petals. And then the Clematis glaucophylla, the white leaf leather flower, um, is also blooming right now. And it's kind of a similar blossom, but it doesn't, the, the petals at the tips don't curl back as much. Um, but both of these, again, um, you'll see bees, you'll see hummingbirds and different pollinators visiting them. So for, for these species, you might need to look at a nursery that specializes in native plants or unusual vines, um, but they are available. and um, quite tough and attractive and, and different things for your landscape. I do want to mention for vines um, that if you are in an area that has a high fire risk, a high wildfire risk, um, vines in the landscape, you know, they do travel and grow from one plant to the other. And from a fire spread standpoint, they can serve like a bridge or a rope and those flames can move across. So um, if you read more about firewise landscaping, um, we have a great publication that's linked here. And of course, when you go to the um, archive for the plants, pests, and pathogens, and the, especially the Plant These Instead archive, you can see these slides and all of the links will be live. You can click on them and get to these other resources. So you can learn more about firewise landscaping, especially if you're in a, a high fire risk area. Um, the recommendation is not to have vines around the home, especially what's called the survivable space within 30 feet of the home, particularly these more these larger, more vigorous vines. Um, just and it's thinking about how vines can be, you know, a bridge for flames to move. 
So something to keep in mind um, and keep safe. Uh, I also mentioned, you know, starting off, we are not planting some vines because they're invasive. And um, we get lots of questions about invasive plants, particularly if the plant's invasive, why can it still be sold? And um, that's because legally invasive is in North Carolina is not a legal term. If something is classified as a noxious weed, it cannot be sold in North Carolina. And that um, noxious weed classifications um, are regulated by the North Carolina Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. You can go online and see their noxious weed list. Um, but we don't actually have just this one unified list of invasive plants for North Carolina. Like this is everything that's invasive in North Carolina. And it's important to remember that invasive plants, just like all plants, are very regional. So we see things that are invasive maybe just in the western part of the state that aren't an issue in the coast, uh, vice versa. Um, so always when you're reading and learning about invasive plants, um, also learn specifically about what areas is it an issue. So there's a lot of things linked here where you can explore invasive plants, particularly um, information about plants that are invasive in North Carolina. Um, again, in the, the archive, you can, um, you can access these links and click on them. And we'll add that to the chat in just a minute, that link where you can get to the archive. And I am going to close out with just a few announcements. Um, we're still looking for volunteers to help with our remote hotline. Um, inspire, connect, empower webinar that we are planning hopefully for sometime in June. Um, we, if you are doing something different in your county with hotlines, particularly with volunteers being able to access and respond to questions, you know, without having to come into the office, we want to hear about that. We want you to share that with other people in the state, whether you're using Zoom or some type of email account or help desk system. Um, let us know. Send us an email at ncemgprogram at ncsu.edu, and we'd love to have you share that in our next Inspire, Connect, Empower webinar. We've got a, a great webinar coming up at the end of June, June 29th. Can I use this image? This will be led by Will Cross, who is with NC State Libraries. He's the Director of Copyright and Digital Scholarship. And um, he will be talking about things like when you are using images and presentations or posting them on social media, um, what do we need to know to do it legally? And um, what does copyright law and how does fair use apply to us in those situations? What are Creative Commons licenses? Um, so this would be a, a great webinar to learn more about how to search for images and make sure you're using them correctly in our educational outreach. Um, this uh, announcement is about a two-part webinar series on trees and storms, you know, hurricane season maybe has already started or it's going to start very soon. And we always have to think about um, hurricanes and other storms that come through North Carolina and um, the potential to damage trees. Um, so Dr. Barb Fair, who is our NC State Extension Urban Greening Specialist, will be leading these two webinars. They are free and open to the public, so everybody can attend. Um, you are asked to register, and um, they're being sponsored by the North Carolina Urban Forest Council. Um, so you can register on their website. I encourage you to, um, to check those out. Some more opportunities if you're thinking about the summer and things you want to learn about this summer, the Understanding Plants. Um, class or course is going to be offered again. It is an introduction to botany. This is one of the Extension Gardener courses offered between the NC State Department of Horticulture and Longwood Gardens. It is online and self-paced. Um, the general public, anybody can take these courses. Um, there, it's 189 if you're a general public, but there is a discount um, for Extension Master Gardeners and J.C. Ralston uh, Arboretum volunteers. So be sure if you um, sign up to get the discount code if you're an Extension Master Gardener volunteer or J.C. Ralston volunteer. The Plant ID courses will also be offered um, this summer, and there's a couple of new um, offerings. So if you've taken some of the classes, you might want to check out the new ones. There's going to be a course just on houseplants, succulents, and cacti, and another one that focuses just on vegetables, herbs, fruits, and nuts. Um, in addition, the annuals, perennials, vines, and ground cover course will be offered along with trees, shrubs, and conifers. This is another, um, uh, this is part of that Extension Gardener series that's offered in um, 
collaboration with Longwood Gardens, and there is, again, the discount for Extension Professionals, Master Gardener Volunteers, and J.C. Ralston Arboretum Volunteers. Um, if you want to take one of the courses now, you can, and, and there's another one you want to take, it will be offered again in the fall, all four of the courses in October. So you can go online to learn more about them and to go ahead and register. And then just to wrap things up, the International Master Gardener Conference registration is open. Um, it is going to be virtual. It's in September. Um, the registration is $150. We encourage you to definitely go online, check out the amazing lineup of speakers and activities that will be going on, and encourage everyone to attend um, and register today. Next month, we will be back June 22nd, and our focus will be current pest and plant disease issues with Matt and Mike at the Plant Disease and Insect Clinic. Um, so until we get together then, we wish you all happy gardening and, of course, remind you that you can watch our recordings um, on our YouTube playlist um, and learn more about the upcoming schedule at go.ncsu.edu slash ppp. So we appreciate everybody being here today. Greatly appreciate um, Shannon Curry, our guest speaker, and everything that Matt and Mike shared with us, and look forward to seeing you next month. And I see that Caroline has added some of the links in the chat, um, and I'm not seeing any specific questions. So I am going to go ahead and um, play our music to, to send us out and stop our recording.